Well, uh, good morning, everybody. I can see there's, there's about 100 people there. Is that right? I think. Uh, and I haven't met most of them for heaven knows how many years. And I, I do hope this uh, wretched business of remoteness will uh, soon come to an end. Anyway, today I'm going to try and do what it says on the tin. Um, I'm actually going to be talking about the white face data in Cumbria and what we've been doing with it or to it. Uh, and I'm hoping the talk won't last more than the scheduled half hour. I hope it won't. Um, I'll do my best on that. I've got the time on screen, as you can see. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about the white face in wider areas, but I do think it's quite worth sharing uh, the, the rather strange distribution this species has in this country. Uh, it is uh, rightly described as disjunct, and, and you can see from this map but it certainly is. Uh, historically, there's been that, what I call the southeastern colony, based particularly on Thursley. There's been a sort of a Northwest Midlands group, um, and there's been a Cumbria group. All, those are the English populations, um, historically, and those four now are the main centers of uh, significant population in England. I haven't mentioned, mentioned the Cheshire project there because I'm not entirely sure what its status is just at the moment. And you'll see that in England there's also historically, and we're probably talking 19th century, there was the Thornmoors site uh, near Doncaster. So it hasn't been entirely, uh, certainly westerly in, it, in its occurrence. Obviously the main centre of distribution is up there in Scotland. And I put that picture there on uh, the top right to show you that, although we think of it as a forest bog species, uh, it can occur in pools in quite challenging looking country. And those pools in the foreground there have white-faced data larvae uh, at the head of Glencoe. So it's, it's quite a tough species. But the interesting thing is it doesn't occur in certain places where you might well have expected it. Uh, in Southwest Scotland, which has got some lovely bogs, including the, the silver flow there where the azure hawker used to occur, and many other bogs systems, never any records of white-faced starters. And of course, there are other areas with lots of good bogs, uh, West Wales, Ireland, again, no records of the species. So it's curious. I, I'd be interested to see whether the, the genetics talk casts any light on any of that. And the other thing about it, looking at that map, uh, the complete lack of casual records across the country as a whole. It is not, not a mobile species at all, which is really why we've been doing what we have been doing up here. Anyway, uh, back to how it all started with, with me. Uh, I came to work in Carlisle in 1969, 1970 at uh, Tully House Museum there. Um, very green behind there is at that point, uh, but I did discover that it has a wonderful insect collection, including a dragonfly collection. And amongst those were, of course, uh, white fest darters. Um, and I even was even more surprised when I discovered that the some of the specimen, well, the specimens were from the site called Cumwitten Moss. And I actually lived at Cumwitten. Um, so it really got me going out there, to, naturally hoping to see it. Uh, and I was very disappointed um, in the early 1970s to discover it wasn't there. The areas that it obviously bred in had filled in uh, and there were no dragonflies on the site at all. So that was my first sort of lesson in, in habitat change. Nothing is static and working it out, I, I reckon the species had probably gone from there by possibly about 1960. But luckily for me, there was another moss land not all that far away from me, only about 15 miles, called Scalby Moss, which became an absolute magnet because that was a white-faced data site and indeed still is. Um, interestingly, white-faced data was only known from there since 1946, when it was discovered there by uh, no less than Derek Radcliffe. Um, but as you can see from the shot in the screen there now, even when I arrived there, it had pools that looked like that, pools that used to be pools, because in fact, they were old peat cuttings that had filled in. 
and even in those days in the 1970s, we went that far away from scenes like that black and white one there. We're talking long, small scale domestic peat cutting, uh, not, not, not industrial extraction. And this went on on all sorts of local mosses, particularly in Cumbria and I'm sure elsewhere. Uh, and that left behind it a trail of pool, pools that uh, were fill, filled in uh, peat pots, basically, but they continued to uh, infill with, with sphagnum. Uh, and here's a very good demonstration of that process in action, because this, this nice shot across uh, Scaleby Moss, uh, taken in 2007, um, look at the cotton sedge in the, in the middle distance here, you can see that there might have been a pool there. And if you look at my slide, which was taken in 1985, there is that same pool. And at that time, as you can see, it had a mixture of open water and floating sphagnum. And in fact, at that time on Scalby Moss, there were many, many more pools that looked like that. And as I was discovered, as I kept on visiting it, they kept on going. So the habitat was on the, on the move, on the change all the time. And I soon realized that as far as the white-faced data was concerned, we had to do something about it. Those blue areas in that map were at one time all old peat cuttings um, and they gradually, gradually disappeared. I was lucky at that time that Natural England, as it then was, he had a conservation officer and that person actually did work, organized project work on SSSIs. And it didn't take a lot of persuasion to get him to talk about doing new pools on Scalby Moss. And that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, those are the ones he created. He actually managed to get six different pools dug. I'll show you in a minute what, what they looked like. And it was a very good operation because those hatched areas, there's a detail. Uh, the, the, way, the spoil was very carefully spread out over the adjacent Moss London. In almost no time at all, it became integrated with the site. And today you can't tell that those pools have been dug out uh, in, in recent years at all. And there is a, a nice example of one of them today. Um, in fact, it's one of the best pools for white-faced starters on the site. Uh, and there are another five that are in similar condition. So in fact, though not many people know this, we'd actually saved the white-faced data at Scalby Moss in 1993, or we'd almost saved it because it wouldn't have lasted that much longer, I fear. But today, these pools, which are many years on, are good. They're about 40 square meters um, in area. They're a good two meters deep in the middle into solid peat. Uh, and, and therein, I think, lies their, their salvation. I have never known them dry up or get even near to drying up. And last this, this, this year, we had almost no rain for the whole of the uh, spring summer season. Uh, so they are, they are really good habitat. And that's really nice. But uh, that doesn't mean other change isn't going on. Uh, and that is what has also worried me all through the period of looking at Scalby is that um, trees keep on growing. At one time, Natural England actually had a, a good clear out and they removed the bulk of the small trees. But within about a dozen years, this mighty crop of little conifers and birch trees is becoming a menace. And there is no obvious means of getting anybody to remove it because uh, English nature don't do that sort of thing. It's in multiple ownership. Um, it's not a priority site, despite its invertebrate interest. So it was a worry to me. And the other reason for doing our project, or the main reason really, was the thought that Scalby, despite its good pools, might still become a woodland and it might become unsuitable for the species. So hence the project really. We were lucky, we had a very happy coincidence in the late 1990s. Uh, local biodiversity action plans were all the rage. Um, and in fact, I already had started to write one for the white-faced data and indeed for the variable damselfly too. Um, but at just the same time, uh, Cumbria Wildlife Trust, which is our county wildlife trust, had acquired a very large site in the south of the county, 350 ex hectares uh, uh, Fowlshaw Moss. And the warden there, whose picture we see in the top corner there, uh, John Dun Dunbavin at the time, 
it was immediately he, he became aware that that was an old site for white first data when the trust acquired it it was a conifer plantation a massive one but john was keen even then that we should uh, we should think about getting white face darters back so he and i and his partner actually set to work on a project to actually make a proposal um we'd we'd got a we'd got a biodiversity action plan um all we needed now was a, a proper report uh, to get permission really to undertake a reintroduction project using scaleby as a donor site and we used uh, IUCN guidelines, those that were available at the time as a, a template for our report. And we, we filled it all in very, very uh, carefully and deciduously. We had a 12 page report and this has stopped working. Uh, why is it not working? This is, uh, sorry, this is frozen. Oh, no, oh, no, there we are. Um, that was our, that was our main aims as far as reintroductions were concerned. We wanted to work out how we should do it um, and a very ambitious target that by 2010 we would have actually started to implement a, a reintroduction um, so we'd set ourselves a task and we were determined to carry it out so there's my report um, still available for anybody who want, wants a copy very welcome to have it um, and we circulated that to obviously english nature the landowners uh, other experts like at the time Tim Banyan, um, Betty Smith at the time, others. Uh, everybody's everybody was quite happy that we should do it. No one had any big comments on our methodology. I don't think English Nature were too impressed that the project would last that long because of climate change, but they didn't say you can't do it. So we we, we basically started. Those are our, our aims. And we really wanted to, as I say, make it a flagship species uh, on a continuing basis in Cumbria. And we wanted to ensure it was still part of England's biodiversity. And we wanted to develop experience that we'd tell other people uh, how we did it so that they could do it in the future. So we needed to create the right conditions in scale in Falshaw Moss. Uh, we needed to obviously use scale B as the main population nearby uh, for reintroduction. There was nothing else any nearer, nearer than that at all. And then we were going to have to monitor the whole results and then spread the knowledge around. That's, that's what our intention was. So we developed a plan, and I'm not, you don't have to read this, you'll, you'll be pleased to know. Um, basically, it consisted of three phases. All, I mean, all this was top of the head stuff because nobody had done this before. So we didn't know whether it would really work properly. Uh, three years, what we call the pre-introduction phase, we would monitor the, the donor site, we would monitor the reintroduction site. We hoped we would undertake some genetic analysis, I'll come back to that much later. We'd produce various reports and we'd do that for three years. After that, we'd have a three-year period of introducing larvae to the new site. Uh, and at that stage, it was envisaged that we would introduce only mature larvae. In fact, about a hundred in each year that was that was the good intention and then we'd have a what we, what we thought well we'll have a three-year phase just seeing what happens doing monitoring again at both sites monitoring by collecting exuvia um, and well we'd have to see where we went but we knew perfectly well that was our theory uh, we didn't know whether it would work in practice uh, we hadn't factored in the weather or we knew we'd get a lot of volunteers to help us but Again, it was a, you know, it was a, a commitment that we didn't know quite what we were making it ourselves into. Um, so we started first of all in the pre-introduction phase. Very nice task on good good weather days, uh, sitting around pools, leaning over the edge, looking for white face data exuvii. This is at uh, Scalby Moss, of course. Um, bigger tasks than you might imagine when you have quite a large population. Uh, which all emerges relatively synchronously there's a lot of stuff to collect and you have to look carefully to find it and you have to be very careful because uh, and also you have to do this when it rains um, it's not just a, a fair weather activity and we plan to do these sessions uh, four times each year and in fact 
uh, for a very long period, we've actually continued that process. We've got a, a massive record, and that's just from the six pools that uh, English Nature created in 1993. But of course, while we were doing all this collecting, the dragonflies were emerging, and you had to be extremely careful not to knock one off its, if it's perch, and sometimes you might not find it until you'd parted the heather. Uh, so it was it wasn't a fast operation, even with a you know quite a, a decent sized team, or you'd find um, tenorals are you know, just about to take first flight. I mean, a lovely introduction to dragonfly natural history for a lot of people. Each time we used a team of at least usually four counters, which included me and uh, John Dunbavin um, as well. Um, but each time the team members were not the same. So a lot of people got to know a lot about dragonflies, but that also had its downside, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, all we did is just collected all the skins we could possibly find, because obviously we didn't want to double count uh, when we came to the next visit. So, so coming back home, all those containers, uh, it's counting through the contents of each pool and keeping a record of them. And there's a heap of a couple of thousand at the end of a, a couple of hours, careful counting at the end of a collecting day. Uh, that's part of the task and it, it meant it to several hours each day. As a result, we've got all that data. Uh, each line is for one of the six pools on Scaleby. What it actually means, um, I'm still pretty unsure. One thing it tells us is we were not, causing the population to decline and that's what we were really wanting to show uh, to the conservation bodies that we were not harming the donor population and I, I think the graph clearly enough does show that um, but I think the sort of variability in it is a reflection partly of what I was saying in that the counters varied from year to year different experience the weather varied from year to year and if counting was two, two weeks apart, uh, wet weather would obviously wash more exuviae away and so on. Um, and people had different experiences and different efficiencies at finding skins. And all these things, I think, have to be factored in. And while it looks like an impressive collection of statistics, which it is, um, as I say, what it, what it really tells us is, is, is less of a certainty, I'm afraid. BDS got a little bit nervous. Uh, what we'd started doing, as well as moving mature larvae, I'd soon come to the conclusion that 100 mature larvae wasn't all that many, really, because they might not emerge all at once. They might not um, survive bad weather when they emerge. They might be predated. They might be predated in the water. They might be predated when they were flying. Um, and what the breeding population, actual mating population, would be from 100 larvae was well, very debatable. But BDS were nervous about it, taking sphagnum containing eggs and larvae, uh, which we'd started to do quite early on because I thought that was a good backup. Um, but BDS got a bit nervous about it because of the biosecurity issues. Um, so we, we did attempt to get eggs. Uh, actually, it's quite easy to get eggs from a white faced data or presumably many other dragonflies. You just dip it into a tube and it produces eggs. Um, that's the easy bit. The more difficult bit is catching a female white-faced darter, which is into egg-laying mode, uh, flying out over the water, of course. Uh, so I found the easy way to get them, or the only way to get them, was to catch a mating pair and separate them, and then use the female. So we did try doing that, but it was a very slow process, and we discovered not all the eggs hatched, of course. Some of them went mouldy, and we decided that it just wasn't a practical proposition for the resources we had. So in fact, after one year, we just we just abandoned that as a technique and went back to putting handfuls of sphagnum into the into the pools uh, as well as larvae. Let's move on and look at the um, reintroduction site, Foulshaw, which is about 80 kilometers south of the, the donor site at the opposite end of the county, at the head of Morecambe Bay there, uh, the Kent Estuary. Um, you can see from the old Ordnance Survey map there, that's, that's Falshaw Moss, that's 350 hex hectares. And it, you can see the whole thing was mapped as conifers. Um, so in, the Trust had a, a massive task to restore that site. They had to get all the trees off. They had to re-wet the site. But they started in 1998 and they didn't finish until 2014. 
Um, a part of the moss looked like that in the picture there with Mirica and Heather, um, but the rest of it was conifers. And so there were years and years of this heavy machinery on the site, cutting great big ditches, um, using massive grants, um, environmental grants. They were very lucky that they got some very good grants and they did good deals with the people who har harvested the timber so that, um, that they could uh, get the value of it rather than being paid direct. Uh, they were quite very canny. So um, here we are looking at the part of the site and it's only that bit that I've ringed in green on the map. Um, that's what's showing on your screen and the area I showed you with the Mirica and Heather is that bit that I'm moving the, the pointer around now. The actual reintroduction pools are those areas ringed in yellow and we made five of them much the same specification as the Scalby pools but also, as you can see there, there were some huge ditches and some of them had pool-like expansions to them uh, there, 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 where the red arrows show. So in fact, already there was a lot of wetland habitat. In fact, today there's, there's even a good deal more. So the actual reintroduction pools were actually within an area which was actually millennia, strewn with millennia in those days after, after the trees um, had been removed. Here we're looking out across to where the reintroduction pools are. They're in the near, in the middle distance, they're just all that big area there is millennia mire, very wet mire, and the reintroduction pools were in that area too. They were beyond the public access area really, um, but we had to get to them of course. Uh, they ended up looking like this and look very nice indeed. I mean, a massive amount of uh, floating sphagnum, but not too much. Some open water, absolutely ideal conditions for reintroductions, we felt. We did monitoring, of course, before that, and we particularly looked to see what other dragonflies were using the pools as well as, as, well as other freshwater invertebrates. Uh, black darters are the obvious because it's hugely abundant there, and we had no trouble at all in finding those. Uh, almost immediately. So we were soon very convinced that the pools would work perfectly well for the darters. Um, we started in 2010, but in 2011, uh, our president, I don't know whether he's watching today, but there he is in the picture. Um, we actually made a very short film um, for, the, believe it or not, the BBC One show, um, a bit out of their normal, normal comfort zone, but um, they did some very nice filming on two of the only good weather days in the whole of 2011. Um, but there's Mike with me uh, tipping larvae into uh, the pool at Fowlshaw. They got some very nice, very short pr production, but it's they got the whole sequence of uh, a beast emerging and even flying off and it's very nice. So a lot of people nationally saw that process, which is really good. Of course, the real hard work at Fowlshaw was monitoring. Those pools were not that easy to get to. We, we, we needed absolutely hard data on how many exuvia uh, were appearing because there's no way at all counting adults would have told you anything about the population there. So we were very lucky, in, uh, particularly with Heather and Tony Marshall, who are BDS members and lived not that far away and were also um, ecological contractors, uh, that we were able to use them to do exactly what we wanted, which was produce sheets like that, which were very meticulous counts fit from each of the pools and we deliberately didn't put stock in certain pools so that we could see whether there was any indication that there was a spread and indeed we were going to get, we soon were able to show that that was happening the gray areas on the on that chart which again you don't need to read uh, are pools where no counts were expected so we knew straight away uh, what, what was going on and we were able to continue that process while they were particularly for for several years from the start of that reintroduction and that gave us a very very good data set and very encouraging results i mean there are two years um 2015 and 2016 which you show a very nice big increase between the two years we can sh show what is happening at each of the pools um all very good but the only way you can have data like that which is consistent is to use an expert team who really know what they're doing and are very consistent in the in their methodology and I'll be forever grateful for the sort of results that they will be they were able to be used for us. They're really quite magnificent. We also tried to encourage a bit of public participation, of course. It soon became clear that 
once the white face starters got going, they didn't just stay around the pools, they soon got all around the site. So we devised some little um, forms for visitors to fill in as they walked around the boardwalk on the site. Um, obviously, lots of people came because they knew they were there. Uh, and in fact, it was the beginning of uh, white face data tourism as far as that site was concerned, which was very nice. And we got some really nice shots and proof of breedings, stuff like that. Lots of little obscure notes that uh, we had to decipher, but that was just all a public participation exercise, really. As I said, counting, the only way you could count on a site, especially as big as that, was to actually count exuvii. Um, but now uh, things have moved on, really. Uh, I mean, looking this year, uh, that shot I took was in the car park. Uh, that one was beside a pool. But I found as I walk around the boardwalk, there's all sorts of wet areas now with sphagnum in, uh, the white faced artists egg laying in that. It was going on all, all around the place. In fact, in, in a sense, the site is becoming less and less possible to to monitor, to really give you a true population. It, it's, it's so huge, there's so much water. A lot of it isn't very accessible. Um, all one can say is uh, the process has worked and seems to be continuing to work, uh, which is which is very encouraging indeed, um, and without harming the donor population. I'm going to divert just for one moment, to, just to, to mention uh, another very small population of white-faced darters uh, in Cumbria, which is on Clave Heights, which is opposite Windermere, where there's some quite magnificent big miry sites with um, wonderful pools, but they have no floating sphagnum um, on the whole because that the, the water is too mineralized uh, for sphagnum uh, cuspidatum to um, occur. Um, but there had been a tiny population within Claif, um, long known, uh, certainly back to the 1930s, um, not at this site, but we found it at this one, which is another little site within Claif in the 1990s. We think the original site, in fact, disappeared around about that time. Uh, and we were getting tiny numbers at this brownstone moss, which I think was probably a modified uh, moss land in, made into a probably originally a fire pond. Uh, but I'm afraid the last exuvia that we know about ever from that area was collected in uh, 2020. And we believe the Clay Heights population has actually gone. Um, but part of the reason I mention it is that there's a lot of peatless peatland restoration work going on in that area, and I see it as quite possible that one could develop new sites in proper peat, peat, peat areas on the site uh, and get the species going again there. It, it would be nice to think that could happen, and it's such a massive area, wonderful area, uh, so I have great hopes for that. Uh, encouraged by Falshaw, particularly the Wildlife Trust, of course, has got many reserves in Cumbria and it's got reserves on the South Solway. That white ringed area there shows part of the huge area of moss lands on, on, on the Southern Solway. Uh, not all of them belong to the Wildlife Trust, but it, in its sites, uh, Drumbruff Moss is far over to the east within that circle. Um, and there, there are national, you're talking national nature reserve status sites, um, RSPs, BB sites, uh, huge area of potential. So the trust were very keen to get uh, a project going on Drumbruff, which they'd done a great deal of rest, rest, restoration on and is now a wonderful wetland site again um, with lots of pools of various status. But we went to the extent of making sure we created some which we thought really would be suitable for white faced darters. Uh, so in 2012, that picture on the left there, it's part of the run of six pools that were created fresh, again to the sort of scale by specification. And there is one of them uh, in this the current year. And you can see how soon such pools mature. Um, lots of floating sphagnum, lots of aquatic life in them. Uh, so in fact, you know, we started moving stock from Scaleby um, in 2018. Um, we, 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 we're now using only transferring sphagnum uh, from the summer period when it contains a mixture of eggs and hatchling larvae and no doubt earlier generation larvae. 
the downside of all of this, and I, I, I feel awkward about it, and I can't think of a way around it, is that we don't know the quantities we're actually transferring. Uh, it would take a massive effort uh, to work out what was in, what we were moving, um, but it ought to be done. All I can say is it actually works um, uh, because we must be getting the critical mass. Um, in this year, we had quite a good amount, despite the fairly newness of the project, we, we got some emergence on site and we got mature larvae and we hadn't put those mature larvae in. Uh, they had grown to maturity themselves on site. So quite obviously, they were at least able to go through the cycle, life cycle there. Whether the habitat suits them totally, it's much more exposed than um, certainly than uh, Scaleby. But on the other hand, Farrell is quite exposed. It's to the southwest particularly. So why not? A uh, few more, it'll take us several more years before we know you know, how successful that really is. So, yeah, I think I'm more or less on time. I just want to talk about what we have learned because other people will not want to know that. Um, obviously our methodology, even though it's a little bit unscientific, does work. Um, but the process from start to finish, and I mean, you know, getting the permissions and everything to thinking, well, this has worked. I reckon it's a decade of work to be pretty sure about it. At least it, that, that's our experience here. Um, and the key to it is as well that, as I said from right at the beginning, these habitats are not static. Um, that is why any projects must be in seat, uh, sites that are protected. They are peatland sites. They have long-term management prospects so that pools can be maintained, new pools can be created, uh, and the species actually cared for. Otherwise, our efforts will have been, in the long term, they will have been, been wasted. Um, climate change, uh, deep pools have worked. And I would say to anybody who's making pools in the future, do make sure they are deep because drought is becoming a problem. Uh, on mosses, um, in, on any sites. Um, so water, permanent water is important, but it also must be in peat. Uh, Tim Banyan uh, told me that more pools and smaller pools would be absolutely fine. Uh, we haven't gone into that one yet, but I think one of the strategies will be in terms of site management is we start digging around existing pools, smaller ones that we can move some sphagnum into very quickly uh, and th get things going so that we don't damage uh, existing sites too much. Uh, but um, I look forward to that happening. Um, you do need a lot of people to do this. Uh, we've been lucky. Um, teams of volunteers at the monitoring Zuvia at Scalby. I mean, we've used over 100 people in the course of the process. And as I said before, they have that has spin off benefits um, because an awful lot of people learn a lot about dragonfly natural history in that process, and that's really good. Um, obviously, to do all this, you do need pools you can get at. And I know some sites, and I think that's been a problem at Cheshire, that getting to the edge, edges of pools uh, is not always easy. Uh, and into firm, if you're digging into firm peat, uh, nice uh, solid margins are an absolute godsend in, in terms of monitoring. Uh, they can cost, it can cost a lot of money to do this, but we didn't have to spend any money uh, significantly on um, special work for the white first data. It was always part of a larger project. So it, in effect, uh, the actual site work uh, cost the, the actual project nothing. Uh, the main cost was getting people around to sites, um, sometimes busing volunteers to, to sites, to, to scale B. Um, staff time the wildlife trust allowed its own staff time freely for the project so again that was not costed into any basic budget uh, as far as i was concerned so it was a remarkably cheap exercise uh, so there are now the prospects of even more projects i mentioned clayf already uh, other people have ambitions uh, and i hear that other people not in Cumbria also have ambitions, but I can't say anything about them because I haven't been told about them properly yet. Um, but it's obviously becoming a, a project for some people for the future. 
I'm a bit embarrassed to talk about genetics finally because there that we failed totally. We could not find enough money to do any work on genetics uh, and nor could it easily find anybody to do it anyway. So we don't know to this day whether we've properly replicated the scaleby population of Falshaw by the amount of stock we put in, I suspect we have, and I am not worried about its genetic status, but I would still love to know about it. And the thing still applies, of course, to Drumbruff to uh, um, its early days. But again, it would be really nice to find a partner who could work with us on the genetics of uh, our projects and give us that final reassurance that meets all the IUCN uh, requirements. And finally, um, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Obviously, climate change, especially higher temperatures, will this, you know, it's quite a northern species, really. When you look at its distribution, it goes up above the Arctic Circle. Uh, will its physiology not be very happy with a warmer climate? Will its phenology change? The, even now, the um, Falshaw population is about two weeks earlier than the donor site, which is interesting, and it's in a slightly milder climate. But yeah. We will be following the species north. I hope not for a very long time, but uh, we don't know. So I think that's I think that's all I have to say, and I think we're just about on time. So I, I shall end my uh, presentation there. Thank you very much indeed. There are some of the many people I feel we have to thank for the project, including BDS itself. We've kept in touch with uh, the Dragonfly Conservation Group, of course, um, but we've had a lot of help, and we do appreciate it. Thank you very much.